let's look at the spectral theorem for real vector spaces. First, we'll state the theorem, then we'll have an interpretation, finally we'll give the proof. So, at the standard inner product on Rn, A is an n by n real matrix, we'll also have the A is symmetric, so A equals A transpose, then all roots of the characteristic polynomial of A are real, so A is all real eigenvalues, and there exists an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for A for Rn. Now, this statement is equivalent to there exists an orthogonal matrix P such that A is put in the diagonal form using P. So, P inverse AP is equal to D, a real diagonal matrix. Recall, orthogonal means P transpose times P equals P, P transpose equals the identity matrix, or P transpose equals P inverse. So, the idea here, if we apply P to our vector space, then the inner product will be preserved. Now, why are these two statements equivalent? First note, if I could put A into diagonal form, that's equivalent to the statement that we have a basis of eigenvectors for A. So we just need to explain the connection between the orthonormal basis and the orthogonal matrix P. Now, A can be put into diagonal form using P. What we'll do is we'll have A, on the right, we're going to put the matrix P, which has as its columns the eigenvectors for A. So let's call those U1 through UN. So P is going to be U1 through UN. We have U1 through UN is our orthonormal basis. Now the condition P transpose P equals the identity. We're just interpreting the row times column products here. So what's happening with these row times column products? Well, when I transpose, okay, that row times column product just becomes inner product of two of our columns. So to have the P transpose P equals the identity is equivalent to saying, okay, the inner product of a column with itself is equal to one. So we have unit vectors. And if we take distinct columns, we're gonna have the inner product is equal to zero. So orthogonal. So our basis of the U's is an orthogonal basis of unit vectors or an orthonormal basis. Now, the spectral theorem has big applications in math and physics. For here, we'll note some immediate advantages. First, we have a condition for diagonalizability. So, a is real symmetric, then we can automatically put A in diagonal form. We can't do that for a general real matrix. Two things that get in the way, the eigenvalues of our matrix might not all be real. Even if they are all real, we might not be able to find a basis of eigenvectors. So when A is real symmetric, the spectral theorem guarantees both conditions. Next, we could think of the spectral theorem as the next step in diagonalizability. So, if we know how to diagonalize a matrix, we can add an inner product to the picture, and then we would ask, when can we diagonalize without disturbing the inner product? So that would mean we want to change a basis that's represented by an orthogonal matrix. So that happens with the spectral theorem. Now, to look at pictures, when we have general diagonalization, okay, all we're guaranteed is a basis of eigenvectors, which just means linearly independent. So while I could make these vectors unit vectors, that's not gonna guarantee that they're perpendicular. If we have the spectral theorem, that we're guaranteed an orthonormal basis. So again, we can make them unit vectors, but we're guaranteed to have this right angle in there. So that makes for a nicer picture and it also makes for cleaner computations. Third, what's the evidence that a symmetric matrix has such nice behavior? 
So we'll work backwards. I'll start with Q orthogonal. We'll have a diagonal matrix D. I'll conjugate D by Q, show that that's symmetric. So we'll have Q, D, Q inverse. So Q is orthogonal. Q inverse equals Q transpose. And if I take the transpose of this product, the rule is we reverse the order, take the transpose of each term. So I'll have Q transpose transpose, D transpose, Q transpose. If I take the transpose twice, we get our original matrix. Since D is diagonal, D transpose is equal to D. So we get our product back. So that means this matrix is symmetric. And we have some evidence that every symmetric matrix might be able to be written in this form. Now, let's start the proof. So our first step is to understand the geometry of a symmetric matrix. So we'll start with definition. If we have V, a subspace of Rn, we'll call it invariant under A. If whenever V is in our subspace, A times V is also in our subspace. So the idea here, if we apply A to our subspace, just carries it back into itself. How should we think of our definition? First, if we're looking for an example of a subspace that's invariant under A, think eigenvectors. So if A has a non-zero eigenvector V, AV is equal to a multiple of V, the subspace formed by all multiples of V will be invariant under A. Second, invariance under A is the precise condition that we want for restrictions. So, if we think of A as a map from Rn to Rn, I can restrict that map to any subspace in Rn. To be a proper restriction, we'd want that subspace to get carried back to itself under A. And that's precisely the condition of invariance under A. So we have that V gets carried to V under A. Third, let's choose a basis for our invariant subspace, say V1 through Vk. I can complete that to a basis for Rn. And then I can consider the matrix for A with respect to this new basis. Now, the recipe for forming the new matrix, we're going to apply A to each basis vector. That gives us a linear combination in our basis. We peel off the coefficients, and that gives us the column that goes with our basis vector. Now, if we choose a basis vector from our invariant subspace, say V1. A is going to carry V1 to a linear combination of the Vs. So that means the coefficients on the rest of the basis vectors will be zero. So the column for V1 will have K entries, and then we'll have all zeros. And that'll hold for V1 through Vk. So I get a K by K block, and then all zeros below. For the rest of the basis vectors, we have no information. So all we know is that we have a block here and a block here. That says, if we have an invariant subspace, we choose our basis correctly, the new matrix for A will be block upper triangular. Now, if A is also symmetric, we could say a little bit more. So in this case, the orthogonal complement to V will also be invariant under A. So let's choose a basis for that, say V1 through V sub n minus k. So if I put that together with the Vs, we get a basis for Rn. And we note, by invariance, if I apply A to say W1, we get a linear combination of the Ws. So that means the coefficients on the Vs are going to be 0. So we're going to have another block which is possibly non-zero, with all zeros above. So in this case, we're going to get a block diagonal matrix. Now, we have to show that the orthogonal complement to V is also invariant under A. So what are we trying to show here? We're showing if W is in the orthogonal complement, then AW is also in the orthogonal complement. Definition of the orthogonal complement. W is in the orthogonal complement if the inner product of W with V 
is equal to zero for all v in the subspace v. So we're going to check that with aw instead of w. So if I take aw and our product with v for any v in the subspace v, we have pushed the a to the other side by the rule for how we transpose in the inner product. So that goes over as a transpose. Now, because we're symmetric, a transpose is equal to a. a v by invariance of v is in the subspace v. So the inner product of w with a v is going to be equal to zero because w is in the orthogonal complement. So that says that a w is also in the orthogonal complement. So we have invariance under A. To choose an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for A, we we'll use a recursive procedure. For this procedure to work, we need the result that every non-zero subspace invariant under A contains a non-zero eigenvector for A. To see this, I need to invoke two previous videos. First, for beyond eigenspaces, real invariant planes, if we have a non-zero subspace invariant under A, called V, so A carries V to itself, then there exists at least one of a non-zero eigenvector or an invariant plane with no eigenvectors. Okay, by plane, we mean a two-dimensional subspace. Now, we can rule out the second case if we invoke spectral theorem for real matrices two by two case. There we show if we have an invariant two-dimensional subspace and we have a symmetric matrix, then we have to have an eigenvector. So that's going to rule out our second case here. So that means if I have a non-zero subspace invariant under A, we can always choose a non-zero eigenvector for A. Now, Let's define our recursion. We start with Rn is a subspace invariant under A, so we could choose a non-zero eigenvector, call it V1. We'll call the subspace V sub 1 the span of V1. Now, for the recursive step, I'll assume that I have subspace V sub i invariant under A. We could form the orthogonal complement, which will be also invariant under A. So we could choose a non-zero eigenvector v sub i plus 1 in the orthogonal complement. Then I'll define v sub i plus 1 as the subspace span of v1 through v sub i, and we just adjoin v sub i plus 1. We repeat until we have n vectors. Then we can assume each of the vectors was chosen to be a unit vector. So you can just rescale by dividing by the length. And by our construction, we have that our vectors are all orthogonal. So we keep choosing successive vectors from the orthogonal complement. Now, that means I have an orthogonal basis of unit vectors. So we have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for A, and that's our result. We can picture our recursive process by considering the matrix A at each step. So in the first step, we have a non-zero eigenvector v. Take its span, form its orthogonal complement. We choose our base correctly. We'll have a block diagonal matrix with a one-by-one one block in the upper left-hand corner representing our eigenvector. Then I could choose non-zero eigenvector in the orthogonal complement and repeat. So we'll have block diagonal with two one-by-one one blocks and then we'll have an n minus 2 by n minus 2 block representing the new orthogonal complement. We repeat this process until we squeeze this large block down to a 1 by 1 block. And what we're left with is a diagonal matrix that represents A. As a final note, we have the interesting fact if we take any real symmetric matrix, form its characteristic polynomial, then Characteristic polynomial factors completely over the real numbers. So it's all linear real factors. So let's just see that. So I'll take A to be equal to the matrix here, 1, 2, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. I 
form the characteristic polynomial be equal to lambda cubed minus 7 lambda plus 1. Then we can graph this polynomial and we'll see that it has three real roots. So that's on the next board.